I just want to kick that, you know, cow like to the field or whatever. And let's just begin to celebrate that we are women and that we are women of God. Are we not? Amen. And so this morning I'm going to be talking about identity. And I like how I have a mirror right here that I get to like look at constantly. <laughs> Uh, but this morning our subject is identity, and the question is, am I enough? I didn't know it until, I guess a few weeks ago, Pastor had said that he is going to be speaking for the rest of the month on identity, so I don't know what he's going to be talking about, but I know that it will be good. I know that right now we are probably in one of the biggest identity crises that we have ever seen in our time, have we not? But I don't want to go there this morning. I just want to speak to not just women and, and men too. I don't know if men uh, suffer from this as much as we women do when we look in the mirror and we see and what do we say to ourselves uh, when we look in the, in the mirror. I want to pray over the word of God. Father, this morning we thank you, Lord, that we are here today in this place by no accident or whether we are watching online, I pray that your word, Father, would pierce our hearts and that today when we leave this room that we will realize that we are enough, that we are more than enough, that you created us um, exactly like you wanted us to be. And I thank you, God, for the opportunity that you have given me uh, to speak to women all over today in Jesus' name. Amen. So when you look in the mirror, what do you actually see and what do you say to yourself, ladies? I'm, I'm sure that most every single one of us looked in the mirror today before we left the house, did we not? Because the way that you actually see yourself can create a reality that is actually contradictory to the Word of God. Do you believe that? Do you believe that you are a woman made in the image of God? And if you don't see that you are, you might just remain stuck. Stuck where you're at. So I want to start today by going all the way back to the beginning with the very first mother of all, Eve. You know, that lady that kind of gets a bad rap. <laughs> right? So, but... Do you realize that after God created the heavens and the earth, you know, out of, you know, nothing, and then he created Adam out of dust, and then God realized something was missing, right? Go ahead, you can say amen. Something was missing. It sounded like, you know, it was all going to be over with, and Adam was going to be just left alone to himself to figure out, you know, what to eat and where to sleep and where to go. And Okay. This might be my last one, but I'm going to make it good, okay? I'm going to make you laugh before you get out of here, okay? But I feel like he saved the, ba the best for last, a woman called Eve. Without Eve, ladies, men, none of us would be here today. Eve was needed to complete God's plan. So, wives, women, have you ever heard your husband say, you complete me? You can talk back, it's okay, we're in church. You completely, well, guess what? He's right, because you do. She was enough. Eve, the mother of all living, what is she known for? What is her identity? Her name is only used, think about this, only four times in the word of God, and it only shows that she had two sons, Cain and Abel. We don't know if she had more children, we don't know how many children um, that she had. We don't even know how long she lived or how she died. We know her creation, her temptation, and her humiliation. In Genesis 3, we're going to read verses 1 through 6, and this is where it all started. Now the serpent was the most cunning of all the wild animals that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, did God really say you can't eat from the tree in the garden? The woman said to the serpent, we may eat the fruit from the trees in the garden, but about the, but about the fruit of the tree in the middle of the garden, God said, you must not eat it, you must not touch it, or you will die. 
No, you will certainly not die, the serpent said to the woman. In fact, God knows that when you eat it, your eyes are going to be open and you will be just like God. Knowing good and evil, the woman saw that the tree was good for food and delightful to look at and that it was desirable for obtaining wisdom. So she took some fruit and she ate it. She also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate it also. So this is where it clearly all changes. The serpent comes on the scene. He wasted no time in deceiving her and provoking her and Adam into sin because he had a plan to sabotage all of humility in one deadly act with four words, did God really say? Question mark. And there we have it. The very first question, and it's a lie from the enemy. So today, ladies, when you came in, everyone should have received a gift bag. Did everybody, all the women in here, receive a gift bag? If you did not receive a gift bag, please make sure and hold your hand up so one of the um, ushers or someone can, can get that. So... In your gift bag, if you want to go ahead, you can take it out. I want you to take out your gift bag, and I want you to open it up. And in that gift bag, you are going to find a mirror. And up here, I have a mirror for all the men who want to look at themselves. It's a big one. So... Let me just ask you this. When you look in that mirror, what's the first thing that we see, ladies? What's the first thing that you see? What's the first thing that you say to yourself? Right now, you're thinking, oh, my gosh, my hair is, you know, like frizzy. You know, my makeup, I, I ran my mascara, right? You're like, do I really look like that? Yes, you really look like that. You're beautiful. So usually what we see this is true, and I, I hope you're going to come along and amen with me so I'm not just the only one that thinks these things, okay? Usually we see the things that we want to change. We see our grandmother's nose, right? We see our grandfather's chin. We see our scars. We see our droopy eyelids. We see our wrinkles. We see our flaws, do we not? When men look into the mirror, I know this for a fact, they do not see that. <laughs> Anybody live with a man who doesn't look in the mirror and say, oh my gosh, my eyelids are droopy. My eyebrow, I'm losing my eyebrows, you know, I'm, right? Men do not look in the mirror and go, oh, there's hair on my face. <laughs> Y'all have women, do they have any idea? Can I get a testimony that they have no idea what it's like to be a woman? Come on. And I have to say, they're very thankful. My husband tells me all the time, I'm so glad I'm not a woman. And I'm like, you should be thankful. You know, you don't have to, you have no hair on your head. It's just great. <laughs> but listen, eight out of ten women do not see their beauty first. That's a high number. Eight out of ten women do not see their beauty first. So why is the mirror still our measuring stick? Why can't we see what God sees? Do you see you're enough or not enough? Do you see a woman of God or a woman who's flawed? Why am I so passionate about this subject on identity? Because when I was growing up, there was a lot of pain in our household and in my family um, that I really have had to work through for a very long time. I was the second child of five children. I was the first uh, girl and the first daughter in our home. And our home wasn't what you would call a peace-filled home. Our home, I wasn't abused, you know, so don't think you know that. I wasn't abused as a child by no means. But our home had a lot of anger in it. 
um, probably because there was five children in our home <laughs> was one of the reasons. But at an early age, the enemy whispered to me that I was part of the problem because I was the firstborn daughter. I wasn't smart enough. I wasn't good enough. Uh, I uh, was very clumsy, in fact, extremely, and I'm still clumsy today if you know me. I have two left feet. That's why Pastor helps me up on the stage and down the stage and in parking lots and getting out of the car and anybody else clumsy in here. Um, so, but I actually took ballet uh, thinking that would be the only answer and the only really good thing that I had going for me was the bun, the ballet bun. Anybody have the ballet bun? Because I had like hair like, yeah, like the troll doll, you know, there's this hair. Um, but I learned early on as a child to do whatever it takes to keep peace. And even after meeting Jesus at a young age of nine years old, I would like to say that all my insecurities miraculously just changed and went away. I wish that was the case, but it wasn't because that skinny-haired girl, big-haired girl, um, buck-toothed girl, little insecure girl grew up to be an insecure woman. And it then became, I'm not a good enough Christian. I don't have enough faith. I don't read the Word of God. I don't understand the Word of God well. Um, I can't pray like everyone else. I'm not like everyone else. I'm not good enough. So today, I want to change that. Okay? Because I know I'm not the only one. Am I correct, ladies? Am I correct in saying that when you came to Jesus, you thought that all of your insecurities and your troubles were going to be over and the little wand was going to just, you know, the Holy Spirit wand was just going to drop all that in you and it was going to grow away, right? But did it? No. So today, we're going to change that. And how do we do that? So I'm going to give you four truths. Number one, you've got to realize who the enemy is the enemy's true identity. You can't win a battle if you do not know who your enemy is. It's not your husband, it's not your mother, it's not your father, it's not your friends, it's not your children. So let's settle that. That is not your enemy. John 10.10 10 tells us that the thief comes to what? To steal, to kill and destroy. But Jesus Christ said, I have come that you might have life and have it what? More abundantly. So are we living the more abundantly life, ladies? Jesus called him in John 8, 44, the father of all lies, the devil, the accuser of the brethren. That's what he does. So no matter what you and I choose to call him, he's the deceiver. And what did he do? He slithered into the garden. A perfect world slithered in selling his bag of lies. And what did he do? He didn't come with a sword. He didn't come with a knife. He didn't come with a gun. I'm coming after you, Eve. What did he do? He came in when she was all alone. She didn't have her headship. She didn't have Adam with her. He came in when she was all alone because the man was not there to protect her. And what did he say? The question, did God really say? Did God really say that? See, the devil can't take away the promises of God. He can't change the truth of who you are and who you are in Christ. But he can put a question mark at the end of what those promises are and he causes us to question if God's word is really true for us or not. Right? God says, I'm holy and I'm dearly loved. And the enemy says, are you? Are you holy? You just said a bad word. Are you holy? You just argued with your children. Are you really holy? Those thoughts, are those really holy thoughts, right? God says that you can do all things through him because he gives you strength. 
But the enemy says, can you? Can you do that? Can you really do that? So what does the enemy do? He puts a question mark at the end of God's commands in an attempt to get you to question if his promises are even true anymore for you today. So anytime that you have a thought that says, did God really say? You need to stop and ask yourself, Where did that thought come from? Amen? When he whispers, you're not good enough, you need to look at Matthew 6, 26. It says, I am valuable to God. I'm chosen and I am appointed. I am justified by his blood. Romans 8, 17 says, I am a child of God. We just sang about that this morning. But by the time you get out those doors and get in your car, what's going to happen? You're going to forget the song that we just sang and you're going to forget the words that I just spoke to you that says you are a child of God and the enemy creeps back in when you least expect it and causes you in an instant to doubt the word of God. So we defeat the devil every time we choose to listen to God's truth rather than his lies. So don't let the enemy be your focus. We are to focus on Jesus Christ, our way maker, our truth giver, God's only son, amen, who defeated the enemy on the cross. Amen? Amen. Number two, recognize the lies. John 8.32 is one of my favorite scriptures. The word tells us that you'll know the truth, and what's the truth going to do? Set you free. Is anybody free in here this morning? Or are you just saying it because I just said, is anybody free in here this morning? It's easy to agree in church, isn't it? I recently read that 95% of our thoughts are habitual. That's a high number, isn't it? 95%, meaning they are the same thoughts that we thought about yesterday and the day before and last week and last year. So let me ask you this. Are you having the same thoughts now that you had last year? Anybody? Right? Amen. And 80% of the average person's thoughts, this is astounding, are negative. That's a really high number. 80%. I'm so stupid. I can't do anything. I'll never change. Everyone would be better off if I weren't alive. It's reruns, replays, and repeats. Did you hear me? The thoughts in your head are reruns, replays, and repeats. And the real danger is when we begin to agree with those thoughts and make them our own. And the only way to recognize A lie is to know the truth. And how do you do that? I read a quote the other day that D.L. Moody once said. I know most of y'all probably haven't heard of D.L. Moody, but a few of us older folks have. He said, the best way to show that a stick is crooked is not to argue about it or to spend time denouncing it, but it's to lay a straight stick alongside it. Think about it. God's word is the only straight stick, the only measuring stick that matters. Amen? Amen. So why do we choose to see ourselves through the eyes of the enemy? Because we do. Why would you give the enemy the mirror to show you who you are? Your maker is your mirror. The enemy is not your maker. God Almighty, who chose you, who created you, not your mother, not your father, it was God, the way maker, who chose you. That's the only thing that we measure ourselves with. So if Satan came in a little red suit, because that's how we think he is, don't we? We see those little you know, memes or whatever, like the enemy's just, you know, the devil in a little red suit and a pitchfork. 
and he's announcing himself as the devil. If that were the actual truth, that that's how he posed himself, what would we do? Right? We would say, there's nothing to you. Go away. We would recognize him because we think he's carrying a pitchfork and he wears a little red suit. I don't know where that came from, but that's, you know, but it's the truth. We wouldn't believe a word that he said, would we? But 2 Corinthians 2.11 tells us that he is cunning and he is disguising himself as what? An angel of light. See, when he deceived Eve in the garden, he, he did what? He cre created scripture even though he distorted it and twisted it. But we have to recognize what the truth is. In Philippians 4 and 8, it says, Finally, men and women, whatever's true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent and praiseworthy, and that is you, woman of God, that is you, man of God, too. Think about such things. Whatever you have learned, has anybody learned anything in the Word of God? Whatever you have received and heard from me, put it into practice. And the peace of God will be with you. Put it into practice. Do what the men do when they look in the mirror, ladies, and say, I am all that. <laughs> right, Wendy? Isn't that what Ed does? Think about what you're thinking about. Pay attention to your thought life. Talk to yourself. You do talk to yourself, don't you? Who in here talks to yourself? And what do you say? It's usually terrible things. I'm so stupid. I'm such an idiot. I can't believe I walked out of the house and forgot my keys. And on and on and on and on it goes. David talked to himself all the time. So it's okay for you to talk to yourself. In Psalms 57 and 8, he said, Awake, my soul. Wake up, ladies. Wake up, people. The word awake translated in the Hebrew means to pay attention. Pay attention. Let's open our eyes. Psalms 42 and 5 says, Why are we so downcast, O oh, my soul? Why are we disturbed within ourselves? What does it say? Put your hope in God, yet praise him. He is our Savior. He is our God, right? Amen? What do we have to be sad about? He's God. Number three. This is the one I love. Reject the lies. And this is what gets us into trouble a lot of times. 2 Corinthians 10, 3 through 5 says, For though we live in the world, we don't wage war as the world does. The weapons we fight, they're not weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have the divine power. The divine power to do what? To demolish strongholds. We demolish every stronghold, every argument, every proud thing that is raised up against what? The knowledge of God. And what do we do? We take every thought captive to obey Christ. Are you taking your thoughts captive? Have you ever been held captive? Yes, absolutely. I'm not talking about by your spouse. I'm talking about by your thoughts. Right? We live in the South. And what do we have in the South? We have mosquitoes. No seeings for you people that don't know what those, you know, little things are that you can't see. I hate those things. There's, thank you, Lord, there won't be any in heaven. But what do we do, you know? Um, you ever try to swat a fly or a mosquito? Yeah, and what happens? They keep coming back. They keep coming back and they keep coming back and they don't go away and they keep coming back until what do you have to get? You have to get the fly swatter. If you don't have a fly swatter in your household, 
You need to go down to Walmart and get you one. But you're not going to just keep swatting at the enemy to get him to, shoo, go away, go away, go away. It's not going to work like that. You have to kill him to annihilate him with the word of God. You cannot do it on your own. You can't do it on your own self. You're, we're, no, you have to do it with the word of God. If you think the enemy is going to leave you alone, it's like nagging children. <laughs> this time I didn't say husbands. Right? Anybody ever had any nagging children or grandchildren? I see one hand in here. Two hands, three hands. Yes. Oh, lots of hands. What do they do? They just wear you down. And how many times do you just give in? I heard a yep. They do. They just, they keep coming back and keep poking and poking and poking and texting and poking and, you know. And you do, you get worn out and they wear you down and they distract you and you just, you just want to stay to the task of what you're doing. You are trying to work for God, you're trying to love God and you're trying to love his people. But the enemy, he just keeps coming back and he keeps attacking you and he keeps just, you know, like a little mosquito in your ear and he keeps whispering lie after lie after lie that tells you, you can't do that. You're not good enough. You're not smart enough. You can't pray right. You know, your prayers haven't been answered. And yeah, 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 yeah. I don't know what that translates, but I bet it translated to you. That, right? And then what do you do? You're just like so tired and worn out and weary that you just give in because you don't have enough strength to just kill him with the word of God anymore. And then what has he done? He's defeated you because we think, let me just tell you this. You know, you hear these people say, oh, a verse a day keeps the devil away. Well, liar, liar, pants on fire. That doesn't work for me. Does it work for you? Does it work for anybody? A verse a day does not keep the devil away. It's only by blasting him with the word of God through the divine Holy Spirit. That is how it's going to happen, ladies. We have the divine power to demolish strongholds. I might not be able to wash dishes correctly, but the dishwasher does. You know, I mean, there's a lot of things that we might not be able to do, but we can pick up our Bible and find a word that will speak right to the enemy and right into your situation and annihilate him and take him out. And you got to do that day after day, line upon line, precept upon precept. It's not just going to happen if you come to church on Sunday. I know I just busted your bubble about coming to church, but I'm telling you, it don't work that way. It just doesn't. Because he's going to keep coming after you and after you. So do you think when we meet Eve, because I believe we're going to, how do you suppose Eve would introduce herself? Hi. My name is Eve. And I am that woman who everybody blames. I am that woman that caused everything to change. I'm a failure. I'm worthless. I'm stupid. I'm inadequate. I'm insecure. I was a horrible mother. My firstborn son killed my second son. I was told I was made in the image of my creator. That's what Eve was told. What would Eve tell us? She would tell us, do not dialogue with the devil. Amen? Don't even engage in conversation or argue with him because once you do, it's hard to stop. 
So what do you do? You know that mute button on the TV? That's what you got to do to the enemy. You have to press the mute button. You got to delete everything that he has ever said to you, every lie that he has told you from birth until now. You have got to press the delete button and erase it out of your mind today. Today, when you walk out of here, all those memories need to go. All of those lies that he has told you that you're not good enough, you're not pretty enough, you're too big or you're too little or you can't have this and you can't have that. Don't give it a chance to enter into your mind again. Amen? So let's wrap this up. The last thing. We need to replace the lies with God's truth. And guess what? The devil hates that, and I love to make him mad. I know I make a lot of people mad, but he's my favorite. (laughs) So for the past, I'd say, I think it's 44 years now, I have had the pleasure to stand behind a chair and for 30 to 40 hours a week, I do this. I look in the mirror. I look in the mirror. Imagine that. I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, wow, you look in the mirror at yourself a lot. No, actually, I'm a hairdresser, and so women sit in my chair. And I have heard countless of great stories, but unfortunately, Fortunately, most of them haven't been so great. And I am privileged to say that why do I still work? It's not just about making women pretty on the outside, but it's, it's really about trying to change something on the inside of them. You know, just when you think I'm washing your hair and you're getting a really good shampoo, no, it's extra prayers because you need it. Don't send the guys to me, okay? Just let you know. But I was trying to think of, I, I, just too many stories to tell, but I want to finish this with, with one of the stories about a woman who um, was abused by her mother. And every day this woman heard that she was stupid, she was worthless, she was a failure, And her mother told her that no man would ever want her because you're ugly and you're not good enough. And she did everything she could do to get everybody's approval, especially men, any way that she could. And so by the time this woman was in her early 20s, she had already had several abortions. And as a result of this, she had a lot of guilt and a lot of shame that compounded her feelings of worthlessness. But then something amazing happened to her. And she accepted Jesus Christ as her Lord and Savior and became a new creation. Amen? But even though she knew that God had forgiven her, She said that the enemy just kept bringing up her terrible past. How could I have killed my babies? She said, what would, she told me, you know, like, what will my friends think of me if they found out all of these things about me? And she had been newly married, and she was really afraid to tell her husband of the things, you know, in her past. And she said, you know, to me, she says, what do you think? My husband will think about me if I tell him these things. And so we, I recommended a book, if you haven't read it, ladies. The book is entitled, Your Scars Are Beautiful to God. So after reading this book, thankfully... She began to heal from all of her wounds that her mother and other people had inflicted on her 
and that she realized that who the real enemy was and that he had been deceiving her all along um, into believing, you know, that what she had done was unforgivable. Um, but what did she do? She did something that really made the enemy mad. Do you want to make the, real, the enemy really mad today? Do you want to? Anybody want to make the enemy really mad? You do exactly what he is not expecting you to do. And this is what she did. She forgave her mother. Even though her mother had passed away, she forgave her for all of the abuse, the men who had used her and abused her. She forgave them as well. She fought back with the truth. So, that little mirror that I gave you, um, if Jimmy, and are you in the audience? If Jimmy, if you'll come up and just play, Tina, if you'll um, come up. I want to, let's close this today with this. I want you to look back into your mirror if you still have it. If you don't, that's fine. And I want you to look at that mirror. And I'm going to say to you, who are you going to believe? Are you going to believe the enemy's lies? Or are you going to be the, believe the truth of God? Because James 1.23 says this, and I don't have it on the screen because I added it at, at the end. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man observing his natural face in the mirror. For he observes himself, and then what does he do? He goes away, and he immediately forgets what he was. See, when we look in that mirror, like right now, and I'm telling you, all these wonderful things that God has spoken over you, that you've forgiven and you're chosen and that you're a child of God and that you can do all things in Christ who strengthens you, that you are not what the enemy says you are. You're not what anyone says you are. You're not a failure. You're not dumb. You're not stupid. You're not ugly. That your scars are beautiful, the ones that you can see and the ones that no one can see, ladies. Because we have a lot of scars that no one can see. And so it's easy in this atmosphere. But when we leave and when we're alone and the enemy comes and he just whispers all these things, you know, what are we going to do? Are we going to believe him or are we going to believe the word of God? Because you know what? The word of God uses a different mirror. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. It is different than your genetics. It is different than your experiences. It is different than your hair color and your eye color. It's different than all of that. Everything that you have been through. It's different. And see, we forget what the Word of God tells us because we use that mirror for the outward appearance to fix our hair and to fix our makeup and to make sure that everything is right. But it's different than any of that. The most important mirror that we will look in does not show us how to fix our hair or how to fix our makeup or how to fix our scars, none of that. Because what happens is when we look in the mirror, what do we do? We see the reflection backwards. Because why do we see the, back, the reflection backwards? Because it's a mirror and that's how we look at it. But do you realize that God's word and his mirror does not see our reflection backwards, does he? 
God knows the end from the beginning. God doesn't see your life like you see it. He sees it in reverse. And He already sees you free. This morning, I want you to stand on your feet. And all across, not just for women, for men as well. This is something that we all need to hear. And, and parents, I'm going to speak to you. Moms, dads, parents. Our teenagers. Don't you wish you would have heard this when you were a teenager? When you were nine years old? When you were eight years old? And you had like two clumsy feet? And the only good thing you had going for you was good hair and a bun. <laughs> you know, don't you just wish that you had that in your life? So we need to teach this to our young girls. We need to teach this to our young men that God does not see our life like we see it. He sees it in reverse. He sees it that we are already free. Even when you don't feel free. Because I know that there's a lot of us in here, we act like we got it all together, and we look like we got it all together, but inside, we don't have it all together. And I'm the first one to stand up here and say, I don't have it all together. Why can I speak this with so much passion? Because this is what I have experienced. And it's taken me a long time now at 62 years old to feel like and to recognize that the mirror does not identify me, that God does. Amen? That God is the one who is my way maker. And so today... I'm going to ask Tina if she'll just sing for a, a few minutes. If you want to come up and pray, man or woman, I want us to be free today. Can we just take five minutes? Just the next five minutes. We're not in a rush, okay? Can we not be in a rush today? Can we just take five extra minutes and not be, you know, this is important. This is important that you... Walk out of here with freedom in the name of Jesus. Amen. So if you want prayer, come up and you're worthy this morning, God. We are so thankful. Can you just lift your hands and be thankful? Thankful for the freedom that God has given us. Thankful that the next time you and I look in the mirror, that we are going to see the image of God. We are not going to see a reflection of what the enemy says to us, but that we are going to see that we are made in his image. Yes. So if we read the word of God and we say we believe the word of God, when we look in the mirror and we say I'm not enough, what we're saying is, is that God, I don't believe you. Amen? So we're not going to call God a liar, are we? Because we are made in his image. Amen. Are you free this morning? I am so glad that you're here, honey, if you want to come up. Thank you for being patient and listening. To come us. on. Y'all want to listen. <laughs> 42 years of that, y'all. I get that every day, every night. I just love to listen to her talk. I just, for no reason, I start crying. I'm like, good God Almighty. What a blessing. I tried to keep it short like you told me to. <laughs> like I told you. Okay. Let's close this up. I want you to go home happy today. Um, I don't think there are very few things on earth that matter more than family. I love my family. Family matters more than anything. I like y'all, but I love my family. Um, some of us on, on days like this, we realize that family for us might not be all that we think that it is supposed to be and look like right now hold on just hold on let forgiveness flow like a river just just offer it and watch what will happen our family blew apart for several years and it was just difficult and all that kind of stuff and I was telling everybody before church this morning today for the first time in forever 
Our entire family is going to be together today. My, we're going to just all together. It's great. So if yours is not there yet, hold on. And if your family is still good, man, there's nothing worth more than that. Sons and daughters love one another today. Spend time with one another today if you can. And watch what God does with that. Let me pray for you as I send you out. God, what a blessing. Thank you for letting us be in the house and hear the word today. Let us say that we are who you say that you we are. God, I pray for families today that your blessing would just descend on them and hover over them, God, and unite their hearts together today, God. Let them enjoy the, the, the time they have with one another today. God, let all the bygones be bygones. Let all that stuff wash away. Father, let the hurts be healed and let God pain be forgotten. I pray that today would be a day like no other that we would enjoy and celebrate one another. We give you praise and we thank you for it. We thank God for our mothers. In yeah. God's name, in Jesus' name, we play and we sit together. Amen. You. Have a great day. Enjoy your day.